Thank you, Farah, and good morning, everyone. So, water. Water is the beginning of everything, from the first creatures on Earth to the start of the office rumour by the water cooler. While Nautilus has been around for 200 million years, we've only been here for 200,000. The first 190,000 of which we moved around and generally relied on our own intuition, avoiding water that looked disgusting, stank, or tasted odd, would have developed quite early. You wouldn't do it twice. Only as recently as 10,000 years ago, when people started farming, we started settling in one place, usually with a spring or water supply nearby. This new type of livelihood spread everywhere and the population began to expand faster than ever before. The farming made it possible to construct <coughs> villages, cities, and eventually states, all of which were highly dependent on water. By 500 BC, Europe was beginning to become urbanized, with around 15% of the population living in large towns and cities by the birth of Christ. The Romans were well aware of the importance of fresh water and built the necessary infrastructure throughout their empire. They're of course also famous for their baths and spas, including those at this, the incredibly decadent Villa Adriana in Tivoli, just outside Rome. The villa included not just baths, but a separate thermal spa, a swimming lake complete with underfloor heated beach, and these are facilities that would be drooled over in the Sunday papers by modern day spa junkies. We must remember that in spite of all their sophistication, the water supply must have differed markedly in accordance with the social status of the people in the Roman town. The rich had running water in their homes. The poor had to fetch theirs from the local fountain. The rich had their own baths and toilets. The poor had to use the public facilities. All of this would have led to different conditions between the rich and the poor. After the fall of the Roman Empire and the collapse of their infrastructure, the water supply and sewage system experienced fundamental changes in Europe. Medieval cities, castles and monasteries all had their own fountains, wells or cisterns. Usually towns built a few modest latrines for the inhabitants, but these were mostly inadequate. The lack of proper sanitation increased the effects of epidemics in medieval towns, resulting in erratic population change. Along with the industrialization and urbanization of the Western world, enlightened people were fascinated with the idea of progress. Ever since the 18th century, science and reason were considered to be able to lead humankind towards an ever happier future. This was the period when the first actual water closet was developed. By 1900, the water closet became a generally accepted cultural necessity in the Western world, the same way that we view aqueducts had been in the Roman Empire. The water closet was a victory for public health without any consideration of where the crap ended up. <laughs> the start of industrialization and the related growth of cities created a situation where environmental problems overwhelmed city governments to a greater degree than ever before, and novel technology was often seen as the solution. The wealth that came from the industrialization also meant we could enjoy the water again, the great Roman spa towns enjoying a renaissance under the pleasure-seeking Georgians. The 20th century was a period of extensive population growth, globally quadrupling, while the urban population increased 13-fold. Now, over half of us live in urban areas. Water and sanitation services had a definite role in this rapid change across the entire globe and how we play. In the early 20th century, the health problems associated with water seem to have been resolved in the industrialised countries, where we have chlorination and other water treatment techniques and taken into wide use. The problems related to water's wholesomeness are largely considered to be a problem of the developing world, just as there'd been a difference between the Roman rich and the poor. In spite of the recent weather, um, and perhaps we should do a, a, a flood defence breakfast in August, um, our water resources are in the north, not in the south and east, where the people are. To put this into perspective, if you take every single reservoir, every river, every lake, including all of the Lake District, in the whole of England and Wales, you start pouring them into Loch Ness. You'll only fill it halfway. This gives rise to water stress. The Environment Agency, or EA, has devised a methodology to provide an indication of water stress for each body of water that's used to supply. They define an area of water stress of one of those where more than half of the available rainfall is used by households within the catchment. 
It is these areas that suffer first if the season's rainfall is below average. All four water companies that provide London with water are categorised as under serious water stress, making them obliged by the EA to provide water resource management plans and consider compulsory metering. So why are they taking it so seriously? The worst case scenario is that the total demand for water in England and Wales will increase by 35% by 2050, and that the rainfall will not meet the demand. Given the storms of the last few weeks, I see a few incredulous faces. However, this is exactly the kind of climate that is predicted. With the total annual rainwater remaining the same, winters will get milder but wilder, and summers are drier with an 80% decrease in rainfall runoff in the southeast, making those areas of water stress ever more precarious. So what can be done? The first way to tackle temporary shortages is to keep more stock during the winter to tide us over the summer months, and this means more reservoirs. In London, we were previously building reservoirs at the rate of one every decade, with the last one built in 1976. Thames Water wanted to build a £1 billion reservoir in Abingdon in Oxfordshire, but the plans were rejected, and instead, they were told to reduce their leakage. The downside of reservoirs is not only their cost, but also the time it takes to build them, having to go through a laborious public consultation. This timing is an issue, because there are a number of reservoirs in the northeast that were no longer required by the time they came on stream, <coughs> due to the changes in the regional economy. For an island country, one possible solution is obvious. Desalination is used extensively in the Middle East, and is the process of converting salt water to drinking water. Thames Water opened the first large-scale desalination plant in London in 2010, and can supply nearly a million people. The capital costs were only a quarter of the cost of building Abingdon Reservoir. However, the plant is only operational during periods of drought because of the costliness in running it. It uses an awful lot of energy and is heavily criticised for the pollution as the salt extracted is often dumped back into the sea. Using water meters to monitor just how much water people are sending down the drains, <coughs> flushing down the toilets and pouring over their gardens promises to cut consumption. This is backed up by the EA and the government. All homes since 1990 are fitted with water meters. By 2008, one third of domestic properties had them, with 8% expected to have them by 2020. But charging people doesn't always have the intended effect, according to UNESCO. This is a problem, it's just too cheap. Um, it's a pound per meter cubed. So it means for the same price of a litre of mineral water from the supermarket, you get 500 litres from your tap. So ironically, if you start metering households, their response is, if they're paying for it, I'll use as much as I like. A report by Deloitte suggests that tiered pricing is the way forward, charging people more when they're profligate with its use. For some experts, the answer still lies in the much debated idea of channeling water from the north to the southeast by a pipeline. Last year, <laughs> it's always dependable. Um, last year, <laughs> Boris calls for the resurrection of a 1942 plan to build a canal from the Scottish borders to the southeast, yielding yet another insightful quote. Since Scotland and Wales are on the whole higher up than England, it is surely time to do the obvious. Use the principle of gravity to bring surplus rain from the mountains to irrigate and refresh the breadbasket of the country in the south and east. Now, breadbasket or basket case. The EA issued a report to address this very question. The most extreme proposal, five parallel pipes constructed between the northern Pennines and London, would cost between five and eight times the cost of building all the infrastructure needed for the southeast. It's simply too expensive. The cost of the Thames Water's controversial super sewer would be a drop in the ocean compared to what this would need. It's well documented that millions of litres of water are lost every day through broken pipes and leaks. While they have been reduced, off what estimate the average leakage to be equivalent to every person in the UK taking an extra three and a half baths a day. Thames Water, with one of the oldest networks in the, in the world, loses about 40% through their pipe. One way of reducing leaks is by what Thames refer to as pressure stabilisation. What this means is by turning down the pressure in the system, less water is lost through breaks and cracks. This is an interesting one. Um, the mains pressure has never been sufficient to service London's high-rise building stock, so they have their own brake tanks and booster pumps, usually in their basements. However, it is affecting the low- and medium-rise buildings, with taps on the upper floors not working and domestic boilers tripping out due to low pressure. 
The domestic market in small booster pumps has surged, and we've been looking at a number of existing buildings to try and shoehorn in the necessary tanks and pumps. However, it's only a sticking plaster solution, and trying to fix all the leaks in reality is uneconomic. So what could all this mean for London? I think if we can accept that radically improving the supply is not going to happen in the short term, so let's explore the very worst case scenario, that nothing is done. What could this be for the buildings in London? In the UK, we take the continued water supply for granted, rarely resorting to supply from standpipes. But what if that demand was managed by supplying water intermittently, something that's endured in cities throughout the developing world? This is actually Italy. Let's call it a rolling dry out, like a blackout on the power network. In a typical office such as this one, we normally store about half a day's work. Here it is in our atrium. Where water supply is erratic, in parts of Africa and the Middle East, it's common to store three, five, even ten days supply. Here it would almost reach our roof. The tank room needed would fill the room we're in, reducing the net lettable area of the building significantly. This is unlikely, however. I think instead we see demand management by ever more stringent limits on consumption. Bream and Lead target a water use reduction between 40 and 50 percent for maximum credit. While these are not legislated, they often made a planning condition. So efficient fittings can make, only take us so far, often on alternative water supplies needed to meet that 50%. The first obvious source is beneath us, the groundwater that seeps into the basements and tube tunnels. This could be harvested using wells and boreholes. However, the EA, who grant abstraction licenses, are seeking reduction in groundwater use and have asked Thames Water to reduce theirs by 10%. So we'll have to look elsewhere. Something we consider first is rainwater harvesting. This is because it yields the cleanest water, so it needs the less treatment. Now, I don't often get excited by analysing weather data, but you can imagine my delight when I was looking at the weather for Oldham, where we were doing a school. Statistically, it rains every three days. And in spite of current recent weather, in London it's only 10 to 14 days. The building is low rise and has a very large roof area to the population. Added to this, as a school, of course, it's closed in the summer, which makes it a prime candidate for rainwater harvesting, which we adopted. Now, what's great for a school in Oldham is not so appropriate for tall buildings in the arid south. The next cleanest source is grey water, and this is the water from showers, baths and basins. There are some systems that treat the water while you use it, so you can enjoy a higher flow while minimising your mains consumption. This technology has cropped up in some unusual places. In military camps in Afghanistan, for instance, where water has to be trucked in on a very dangerous journey, less water means fewer journeys and fewer casualties. On the other end of the scale, we find similar technology in the air, in the shower suites in first class. Grey water with modest treatment can be reused for toilet flushing or irrigation. Unfortunately, the majority of offices don't have a significant and consistent grey water yield, with two thirds of the water already used for WC flushing alone. So grey water reuse is not always appropriate. This building was designed for Siemens to showcase their technologies and be an exemplar sustainable project. It's the first building to achieve dual accreditation for both BRIAM and LEED. Sorry, BRIAM outstanding and LEED Platinum. With careful management of the demand and a rainwater harvesting system, we were able to meet all of their requirements by delivering a 40% reduction in the mains water against a conventional building. During the construction, however, Siemens were keen to introduce their brand new water treatment plant to demonstrate their capability. It's not often we give free rain or, or rain over all of the technologies. We took their membrane filters and chlorine dioxide plants and used it to treat the rainwater to potable standards so you can drink it. We integrated their state-of-the-art bioreactors and more membranes into a system to take all of the building's foul water and reuse it for toilet flushing and irrigation. Now, usually in these things, we like to talk about the height of double-decker buses, um, number of Wembley stadiums for area, and bathfuls for volumes of water. However, in terms of how much water the system treats in a year, the crystal has presented yet another challenge. No one wants that visual image of 10,000 bathfuls of shit. <laughs> so instead, <coughs> bear with me. So instead, I'll give you a quarter of a million toilet flushes that are saved each year. And what was the outcome? The crystal's main consumption is only 10% of a conventional building, and it can be off-grid entirely in the winter. Now, I'm not suggesting this is an aspiration for everyone. One could foresee that the costs for network reinforcement being increasingly common 
developers will become used to allowing space in the basement for alternative water supplies, just as they now begrudgingly allow us for the inclusion of a substation. I think we'll see more developments being good neighbours, seeking solutions that benefit them both. The yield from one serving the demand in the other. A good example of this is a recent mixed-use development I've done in Belgrade, where we capture the water from the baths and showers on the hotel and use it to flush the WCs in the offices and the retail. But what would be next? What if water supply was really a challenge, where its use for anything other than the absolute necessity is rightly scrutinised? This is a new garden in the Middle East. The first reaction is usually a wow, to which I can thank our landscape designers in Grimshaw. The next one is a garden in the desert. Where's the water coming from and is it sustainable? There's a modest supply from the wadi and there's also some low-grade water from the ground. However, we've also been looking at some joined-up thinking with my mechanical colleagues who are also similarly challenged with the cooling. They've come up with a, a site-wide system where we have a large solar thermal array which produces hot water, which is then used by absorption chillers to create cooling. As you raise the temperature of air, its ability to retain moisture increases. It's the same principle that the rising sun will quickly burn off a morning mist. <clears throat> Conversely, by lowering the temperature, the moisture capacity of the air is reduced. So by using the spare capacity of the system when full cooling is not required, we can condense water out of the humid air, literally producing water out of thin air. Gardens are often considered great luxuries, from the historic grand estates in the UK to this, the water gardens of the Villa d'Este, a huge show of wealth and power that you are able to use such a precious resource for leisure. In this garden, only the plants and environments of the country will be displayed. The intention is that the country's citizens will better understand and respect them. The ultimate aspiration is that by recreating this garden, the unique landscapes will be preserved from the rapid urban expansion elsewhere in the region. In this garden, we see how the water can flow from necessity to luxury and back. Thank you very much. So, does anyone have any questions? Could you just discuss the desalination in London? What was, you said a lot of waste products uh, are created, are they? Or, uh, and it's very extravagant on power. It's, it's quite extravagant on power, which is why they don't <clears throat> operate it unless there's a drought on. Um, the uh, WWF are quite concerned about what happens where, with the salt. So when you, not so much for the Thames water one, but in the Middle East where they've got some really big kit, um, by taking the water out and then you're basically push, pumping brine back into the ocean, you're increasing the salinity hugely. And that can be quite detrimental to the uh, local marine life. And the other one is thermal pollution. If you're using the thermal um, um, desalination, is that you can, yeah, increasing the water just by four, four degrees can start killing off the life that's around there. What proportion is um, residential consumption compared to commercial or industrial consumption of water? Where is the pressure? Where is the pressure? In the southeast, it's very much um, residential. So we would use, on average, about 20 litres per person in an office, whereas it's about 160 in the household. Um, elsewhere, when industrialisation is used, um, a lot of water is used, but it's often reprocessed. So while they, they will be drawing hundreds and hundreds of metres cube, they'll have their own kit because they accept the cost of it and will be reprocessing and reusing it. So they tend to be better, although their consumption is higher. <coughs> Agriculture is quite high. But you can argue that that ends up back in the rivers. That was, well, very interesting, very topical with, uh, with what we've been experiencing meteorologically uh, recently. Um, from, a, from a contractor's point of view, I've found uh, his points about sharing um, water across mixed developments very interesting, um, both from a, uh, a cost perspective and an environmental perspective. And there will definitely be something uh, that we'll be looking to potentially incorporate across our schemes in the future. Really good, actually. Very informative. Um, thought he appealed to all the various disciplines and professionals in the room. So, yeah, very enjoyable. Uh, Ed's very interesting and he talks eloquently about uh, a problem which we'll have for, 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 well, for the rest of our lives. He focuses very much on, on technological solutions, uh, you know, which are extremely interesting for us. Um, you know, there are other te uh, um, political issues and, and economic issues which we'll need to focus on to make, uh, uh, make water management work in the future as well. Thanks for having us. Um, I thought Ed had a huge amount of ground to cover, um, a massive, massive topic to talk about, and he did really, really well. 
Um, yeah, I went right through from how the Romans used water back in the olden days to how we use it now and the problems facing the Middle East, the problems facing the UK. Um, yeah, quite a deal to talk about and I did a really good job. <laughs>